Joining us now to discuss uh, all the action on Capitol Hill, Democratic Representative Glenn Ivey of the great state of Maryland. Congressman, welcome back to Morning Rush uh, for another slow news week uh, in America. <laughs> Appreciate uh, uh, having you here. Uh, listen, it, it, it's hard to know where to begin because right. there's so much to chew on this morning. We've just yeah. never been here before. But one of the, I'll start with your side of the aisle because it was clear that the Democrats got in lockstep. Whatever meeting you all had yesterday, it was clear coming out of that meeting, Democrats had said, we're not going to help McCarthy for a long list of reasons that you all felt that he was untrustworthy and did not feel it was Democrats' job to save Republican leadership, which is actually a tradition in the House. What made the party so uniform in helping to uh, boost or uh, to give McCarthy the boot? Well, I think there were a couple of things. The first, I think, is that, you know, Hakeem Jeffries has been outstanding in the way he's led the caucus. He's made sure he stayed uh, attuned to what our thinking is. And, you know, we had a two hour meeting, as you just mentioned, to sort of walk through that and give everybody a chance to, to you know, to, to, to sound off. Uh, but during that meeting, they played a clip from um, Kevin McCarthy's statements uh, the day after we had reached the agreement uh, to keep the government open. Uh, and they played a similar statement that Elise Stefanik had made. And both of those statements were, I think, frankly, disingenuous. They both of the statements essentially said um, the, the, the Democrats wanted to shut down the government, but the Republicans had to uh, sort of take these maneuvers to keep it open, uh, which is, of course, obviously the inverse of what really happened. So that sort of uh, misstatement, I'll say, uh, you know, was one in a series of many. You know, the other one that was pretty recent was uh, regarding the impeachment inquiry. One day he says there's not going to be an impeach impeachment inquiry without a vote. The very next day he launches an impeachment inquiry, uh, you know, that morning. And so we found it sort of difficult to continue to trust what he was saying to us. And also, I think there was a, some sort of conversation between um, uh, Kevin and Hakeem that where Kevin basically said, we're not going to work with you guys to, to resolve things going forward as far as partic potential policies. So if you don't trust him and you can't work with him, I, I guess the thinking for all of us was, well, maybe we can just see who the next person in line is. Maybe that'll be a little bit better than what we've got right now. Yeah, it did seem like that notion of trustworthiness and the lack thereof was really what set a lot of people over the edge from both parties, uh, people on both sides of the aisle. Um, it kind of seemed like, you know, since you guys, you know, you voted to um, boot him or get him out of his speakership, um, it kind of sat back and watched. What is the lesson that you hope people watching uh, this chaos into um, all afternoon and into the night last night? What are you hoping viewers and ultimately voters uh, take from this, um, what, what we saw play out yesterday? Well, I think the hope uh, from, a, you know, what the public is thinking on this is that they'll encourage the Republicans to get their act together. They really have had a civil war that's been going on internally for, you know, really the whole year. Uh, you know, the 15 votes, as you all mentioned on the lead in, you know, wasn't the end of it. In fact, it was just a harbinger of things to come. And that sort of conflict has continued for them all the way through. Uh, and, you know, frankly, the, the larger segment of the Republican Party has been held hostage by this, generally speaking, small group of MAGA extremists who've been pushing for extreme uh, policy positions in, so, in some instances uh, that they know we can't accept on the Democratic side, but more importantly, they know aren't, aren't going to be accepted in the Senate, which is moving forward in a more bipartisan way. So we've, we've had this theater going on here in the House instead of actually getting things done with the exception of the debt ceiling vote and the, the government shutdown. Uh, avert, you know, averting the government shutdown. Not much has gotten through that's actually going to become law. So we hope that, the, you know, whoever the new leader is that comes in decides that we can actually get things done. I know sometimes they're going to be partisan votes, but hopefully we can find common ground and agree on some things and get the people's business done. And Congressman, just to ask a big picture question here, it's complex. There's a lot of reasons people like or don't like Kevin McCarthy. But fundamentally, he faced backlash within his own party for compromising mm -hmm. on both the debt ceiling and to avert the government shutdown. And now has paid the price by becoming the first speaker ever in American history to lose his job in this way. My big picture question here is, 
if compromise is a crime in Congress that can cost you your job, where does that leave our democracy? I'm not sure I agree with the premise of that, of, of that statement because he was facing problems before he even got into the position and started reaching any kind of agreements or having any kind of negotiations with Democrats. It took 15 votes for him to get the position. I think there's a lot more going on there than um, the ability to reach a compromise. But at the end of the day, that's a Republican conference question. House Republicans have to decide if it was reasonable for them to decide uh, we don't want to shut the government down. Why it took him two weeks to get there. You know, the Winston Churchill quote, uh, you know, Americans will always do the right thing after they've exhausted all options. That's what the House Republican caucus did on this. Instead of spending the month of August, for example, which many of their caucus members pointed out could have been done, resolving the sorts of uh, financial conflicts and budget conflicts that existed within their caucus and with Democrats, we had a six-week vacation, a recess, and then came back at the 11th hour and tried to get it all done. It's like having a kid uh, tell you, hey, mom, my, my science project's due tomorrow. Uh, can you help me get it done? Well, you know, as my parents used to say, last minute effort gets a last minute grade. Kevin McCarthy just got a last minute grade. Hmm. And I want to go. Um, is, is there any concern that the new speaker is going to kind of be in the same situation not soon? I mean, I mean, quickly after this, because I mean, you have to think the rule, the one member to vacate, to um, do the motion to vacate, is that going to change at all? And then, I mean, we could just be here months down the line. Well, I, I think it's likely that they'll get their act together at least enough to pick a speaker. I think the motion to vacate. Um, our hope is that we'll move it back to where it was uh, under Speaker Pelosi. You know, I think one vote uh, being able to shut down the whole House doesn't make a lot of sense. So I, I think we could move back in a direction where, you know, there needs to be at least some sort of coalition of, of members who think that, uh, you know, vote needs to be brought to the fore. Uh, there was one version where, you know, the majority leader or the minority leader could bring it, but nobody else. Something like that mm -hmm. where you've got some sort of uh, reasonable filter so that it, you don't run into political gamesmanship, throwing the whole house in chaos. Uh, but ultimately, you know, they're moderate Republicans, we're told, who want to work and get some things done. Apparently, there's over 200 of them. Any number of those, you know, it only would take five or so to work with Democrats at, and who, when we're united in particular to get something through the house. Um, that could be Ukraine. Uh, that there, you know, there's other issues that are, I think, front burner agenda for us. We need to move move forward on those quickly because the American people need us to get the work done. And in five seconds, you can't offer a prediction on who you think the next speaker may be. Is there any anyone <laughs> right now bubbling up as the most likely choice to hear a lot of talk about Steve Scalise of mm -hmm. Louisiana? You know, I, I I wouldn't hazard a choice. Uh, you know, at this point, I, I, it's hard for me to guess who they might pick. Whoever they pick, though, you know, it, we just hope that they will find a way to try and work with us, recognizing there are going to be disagreements and sometimes uh, you know, we're going to have to move in different directions. But the goal is, you know, to find common ground and be able to work with each other and at least be able to communicate with each other and trust each other as we move forward. All right, Democratic Congressman Glenn Ivey, as always, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you.